Welcome to Embargo, intelligent talk about sanctions, export controls, and all things international trade for trade nerds and normal human beings alike. I'm one of your hosts, Tim O'Toole, and with me today, I have a number of guests and guest hosts, um, friends, colleagues. Uh, it's going to be a very good episode today. With me is uh, from Miller and Chevalier, our Richard Mojica and Virginia Newman. Richard and Virginia, welcome. Hey, Tim. Hey, Tim. Thanks for having us. Sure thing. And also, our special guest today is Kate Yin from the Fang Log firm uh, in the People's Republic of China. Uh, she's with us at the Miller and Chevalier headquarters today in downtown Washington. Kate, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. So I'm very excited today uh, because we're going to go a little bit off road. Uh, generally, we talk about uh, export controls and sanctions on this podcast, but in the introduction, we talk about all things international trade. And so today we're going to talk about the, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, which was a law that Congress passed in 2021. Uh, and it dealt with, uh, it, it basically it, it basically dealt with uh, it, it, the situation in China with respect to the Uyghurs and the American uh, attempt to, uh, to deal with that from an import perspective and also from a sanctions perspective. And so uh, Virginia, uh, before we get started talking in some detail about questions that have come up in the last year for the UFLPA. Can you tell us a little bit about what the USLPA does generally and kind of walk us through some of the strategies that Congress wanted the, the government to, to impose in terms of uh, this issue? Yeah, absolutely. So um, for folks that are new to this space and aren't familiar with the UFLPA, you might also hear to it hear it referred to as the UFLPA. Yesterday, I heard to it referred to as UFLPA for the first time. I stick with UFLPA. So as Tim mentioned, Congress passed this year, uh, passed the law uh, at the end of last year. Biden enacted it in December 2021. And then there was a waiting period before uh, the operative provisions came into effect in June of this year. Um, as Tim also kind of mentioned, it's targeted at trying to deal with alleged um, forced labor issues in China's Xinjiang region. And this has been a hot point of political debate between China and the West. Um, this is definitely a wrinkle in some of the things we'll talk about today or the differing viewpoints um, in terms of whether the law is, is fair or not. Um, the law is applies a rebuttable presumption that any goods that are made in whole or in part in China's Xinjiang province are not admissible to the United States. And that builds on a pre-existing import prohibition that the government, U.S. government has long had in place that prohibits the import of goods that are made in whole or in part with forced labor. Um, you'll hear people talk a lot about the in whole or in part aspect of this, which means not just did that final good or a component of it come from Xinjiang, but really anything in the entire good, anything in the shirt, anything in theoretically the computer, any small piece or material which came from China's Xinjiang province. Under this law, the enforcing agency, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, has to apply a rebuttable presumption that the goods are not admissible to the states. Um, in enforcement, we've seen enforcement in the past three months since June of 2022. There have been uh, nearly a billion dollars of, or half a billion dollars of goods detained, um, several hundreds of shipments detained, and Customs and Border Protection has not released any of the goods that they've detained yet. They've been enforcing on an industry by industry basis. So first enforcing in certain high priority sectors. And we've seen that so far in the apparel, cotton industry, polysilicon solar and tomatoes. So I'll stop there because I'm probably getting too far into it. No, no, that was that was actually really helpful. And you focused at the end on one of the things that I wanted to talk about. So at least as I understand the law, so Congress set out first that the government had to come up with a strategy to um, deal with forced labor issues in Xinjiang. And I, and, and I, again, I, I want to emphasize your point. This is, a, this is a very controversial issue in terms of the relationships between the U.S. and China. And we're coming at it from a U.S. perspective, but that doesn't in the sense that we're talking about a congressional law. But we're going to talk later in the, the podcast about China's response to this because it is an issue that uh, you know, certainly the Chinese government disputes. Um, but before we do that, so, so Congress asked 
uh, the government or the, the the executive branch to come up with a strategy. And you mentioned some industries that have been targeted for um, p- this potential problem. Can you kind of describe a little bit? And and uh, at this point, maybe we'll bring in um, Richard and, and and Kate if they they want to talk about this as well. But in terms of how that has evolved, so that is that the that that executive branch started with particular industries and and how they've moved to other particular industries to target for enforcement sure so so far it hasn't evolved much the the uh, u.s enforcement strategy identifies certain high priority sectors the ones that virginia mentioned and in the first three months our understanding and what we've seen in practice is that the government has stuck to those three um, so most of the affected imports that have been detained are in the apparel and solar industry, and both industries have been hit very hard and, and are dealing with this as a top priority issue. But the reality is, as far as we know, it, the detention, the tensions have not expanded beyond those um, those sectors. Now we very much expect that it's just a matter of time, and um, it we think it's going to expand in two ways. First, there's a there's an entity list, kind of um, in the same way as the there's a sanctions list or an export controls list that that is called the UFLPA entity list that lists a bunch of um, uh, entities identified as bad actors by the U.S. government. And who this and who puts it, together that list? Just to sorry to interrupt, but I yeah I, the I, I think- the Department of Homeland Department of Homeland Security DHS. And is it DHS that we're talking about with enforcement with all of this, or who who does the enforcement basically? Yeah, so so CBP U.S. Customs is a part of DHS, and the and DHS has had a DHS and Customs both have um, a part in the enforcement strategy. Uh, there is a task force that a multi agency task force um, that is also involved in the setting of the strategy around this. And that task force, you know, one of its main, um, remits has been to, um, develop this, uh, entity list. Now this, this entity list, uh, it's the first iteration, which came out, uh, around three months ago, um, includes a whole bunch of known, known parties, parties that are either, um, that had been sent, that have been sanctioned, or that have been subject to withhold release orders uh, in the past. So these are all kind of known entities. But the DHS has made it very clear that this list will soon expand. That they'll soon expand this list. So um, uh, from the perspective of kind of the bad actors list, it will soon have uh, a broader set of actors. And similarly, we think that. We're, we also see an expansion into other industries prompted by reports um, coming out from a bunch of NGOs and private parties who are bringing issues connected to Xinjiang back to the U.S. government. Great. And, and Kate, so we so thank you again for coming on the podcast. And we wanted to have you here to, oh, our, our pleasure. Um, we wanted to have you here to talk a little bit about the the Chinese perspective on this law, because I know that you work um, in this area and you work with local law issues that arise uh, as a result of the UFLPA. So so why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do in those areas and kind of how things look from, from, the, from the other side of the Pacific? Sure, uh, it's a very challenging time. Well, with the uh, geopolitical tension, it's very challenging for companies that have to walk a very delicate fine line to comply with both the U.S. and the Chinese laws. So I think for companies um, in this area, it's important to keep in mind the two areas of Chinese law that they need to comply with. One is uh, AFSL, the anti-foreign sanction law. The other is data compliance. There are a number of data compliance laws that we want to keep in, uh, in mind uh, when doing compliance. Uh, and also, I want to bring to everyone's attention that uh, beside complying with the law, it's very important to keep culturally sensitive to avoid media crisis. Uh, so for the first one, the AFSL, the anti-foreign sanction law, it was passed last year, uh, which basically prohibits 
companies, individuals implementing、uh, discriminatory measures interfering internal affairs of China. So,、uh, for parties violating AFSL, they may be put on、uh, anti-foreign sanction list, or they may face private litigations by parties whose interests are hurt. For example, a vendor being terminated. And、uh, we haven't. So you have a question? No, no, no. That, I, I was, I, I was going to wait till. It sounds like there was another part to that answer. So <laughs> yes. Why don't you finish, and then I will have questions. Sure, sure. Yeah. So we haven't really seen private litigation being initiated,、uh, but seventeen companies and individuals have already been put on the anti-foreign sanction list, most relating to Xinjiang, Taiwan, or Hong Kong matters. Uh, and uh, the potential enforcement and,、uh, under AFSL can be severe. There, not only、uh, rejection of visa expelling from、um, uh, China, but also seizure of property、uh, and also loss of business、uh, in China.、Uh, we understand the government has been very cautious of using this tool,、uh, but they can use it as needed.、Uh, so it's important for companies to be aware of it. The other part is data compliance,、uh, though uh, in Uh, for uh, doing the diligence and supplying. Well, let me so let me stop you there.、Okay. So so、sure. let me make sure I understand the the、um, the anti it's the anti foreign sanction law is is the one in China, and it sounds like it's similar to we have a law in the U S called the anti boycott law that does a similar thing. It sounds like where essentially we say if another country has a trade policy that we disagree with,、um, we prohibit U S citizens and U S companies from complying with that law. I think. Europe has similar laws. They call them blocking statutes that essentially try to block U.S. sanctions. So it sounds like China's law is very similar to to that. Is that fair to say?、Uh, I do not know the U.S. law very well,、uh, but uh, it's uh, basically the purpose is to um, uh, give um, a tool、uh, for the government to to protect companies,、uh, right? And and、mm-hmm. and to say. You, the U.S., are telling Chinese people how to act, and if we disagree with the with the U.S. policy, essentially interfering in what the Chinese government views as internal Chinese matters, we're going to tell Chinese citizens and Chinese companies that they can't comply with that law. Is that fair to say? Yes,、uh, I think like the、uh, scope of this is、uh, relatively limited.、Uh, it's、uh, like have to be action that、uh, interfere with the internal affair. Uh, in China,、uh, yeah, and it's、uh, discriminatory. But it, the, pro- but, the problem is that no one knows what that means, right? <laughs> well, and it's the problem with all the blocking statutes. I mean, the ones in Europe, the anti boycott law that we have in the U.S., although that generally is seen to apply only really to the Arab League boycott of Israel, but it it's written broader than that. And but I mean, it's the problem with all these laws, and I think. Which you're going to get to in a second, Kate, and I don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, I, I assume what, what you're going to talk about in terms of the compliance challenges is, you, you have the U.S. government with the with the UFLPA telling U.S. companies,、um, if you if you source from Xinjiang, you have to essentially. Prove that it, that that this item is not the product of forced labor. On the other hand,、uh, if if you go to your supplier in Xinjiang as a U.S. company and tell them, you know, I, I've got to prove this issue or I've got to end my supply contract with you because you're on a particular list, the Chinese company is going to say, no, we have a contract, and going to say, and it would, and I can't even help you do the due diligence because if I help you do the due due diligence, I'll be violating our, our own law about. Compliance with foreign sanctions. I mean, is that basically the issue?、Uh, so, for uh, the uh, suppliers, uh, yeah, uh, there is a risk of that.、Uh, but I think, like uh, for the suppliers who uh, uh, comply uh, with uh, a due diligence,、uh, the risk of enforcement is relatively low. Uh, and uh, uh, they are、uh, the interest、uh, of the suppliers. If they are terminated,、uh, they can sue uh, the uh, U.S. company. Yeah. Now, yeah so Tim, if you this,、oh, this presents a, this presents an uncomfortable situation for both the requester and the per, and the person that has to answer、exactly. those questions. And you know we we've seen it many times with U.S. based multinational question、uh, multinational companies who. Want to ask these questions of their、uh, suppliers, and fear that、uh, by not phrasing the the question in the right way or packaging it in a way that could、uh, somehow ruffle feathers, they too could be swept up 
by, you know, issues concerning the, that Chinese law. So um, it's been it's been a big concern and something that we've had to deal with, which is why we've worked so closely with Kate on these things. Yeah, I mean, and I think it, let's loop Virginia back into the conversation, too. And and why don't you guys, if you can, and, and I'll start with Virginia and then we'll move to Kate and then we'll move to Richard. Give some pointers to to people who are listening about how to to navigate these issues because it sounds incredibly tricky. Where on the one hand you've got a U.S. you know company that is is faced with all sorts of risk under the U.S. law, and you've got a Chinese company that's faced with risk under the Chinese law. Both sides want to comply and want to do business legally. What are the strategies for doing that? Yeah. So. Um- Thanks for the introduction to the to the legal issues in China, Kate. I find this so fascinating. Um, part of what the UFLPA really mandates of supply uh, mandates of importers is that they review their supply chain. So that's where this due diligence requirement comes into play, especially if you're in one of those high risk industries or if you have a product that contains a high risk input as defined in the enforcement strategy or by CDP enforcement, you really need to review your supply chains down to the raw material. And that's where we come into this uncomfortable situation of approaching suppliers in mainland China, asking them about details on their supply chains and potentially for other information to help you conduct your due diligence. Um, I would say that we're seeing uh, it's evolved in terms of how companies are executing this due diligence. and. When we're advising companies, there's a couple different options for how to conduct it. Some people are just kind of sticking to desktop due diligence, not interacting with the Chinese suppliers and trying to collect whatever information they can remotely. Um, That poses some difficulties because you can't really get supply chain visibility without working with your suppliers and and being collaborative with them. Then you're also seeing people, uh, companies work with their suppliers, work with local counsel like Kate, and to come up with a plan for engaging with suppliers and finding ways to ask for an appropriate amount of information that doesn't really go into any politically sensitive issues um, and really relates more to to general compliance. Um, And we're seeing a lot of companies do that. I think a third option that I know has, has definitely been widely marketed is sort of an automated process for collecting this information. There's several platforms that have now popped up that purport to be able to collect this information by sending out kind of automated or service-based emails to your suppliers, requesting them to upload data and documents to the platform. Um, And I'm I'm curious to see if Kate has seen that at all, uh, because that to me sounds like it poses the risk of potentially raising some of these local legal issues uh, without having counsel involved, um, local or or US-based. And that that just occurred to me just now thinking about it, but that seems a little bit risky to me. Yeah, let's hear from the Chinese side, Kate, uh, some of the strategies to navigate this well, you know, navigate the due diligence obligations on the U.S. side, while at the same time not running afoul of the Chinese legal pro- prohibitions on, you know, compliance with certain foreign sanctions laws. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the... Uh um, we have been advising uh, clients in this space uh, and uh, for um, sophisticated multinationals, and I think they would avoid uh, asking very sensitive questions uh, such as this product from Xinjiang uh, and would uh, more focusing on other issues using a culturally acceptable way uh, um, in China. Uh, for example, uh, like Chinese government has been fostering ESG. Uh, and the sustainability initiatives. Uh, and uh, uh, the government, uh, SASEC, uh, which um, uh, is uh, the supervisory agency uh, of uh, central SOEs, state owned enterprises, they established the bureau uh, at a pretty high level uh, of corporate responsibility. Uh, and uh, they have been encouraging SOEs to build their ESG program as well. So while dealing with uh, uh, suppliers in China, uh, asking questions on ESG uh, are accepted. And uh, for ESG, it's a pretty broad concept. Uh, and uh, this uh, would cover many of the things uh, people are concerned in supply chain field as well. So, so I, if I'm if I'm hearing right, if, if as long as you phrase your your questions in due diligence within the ESG framework, that 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 will be more viewed 
locally as a as a as a proper subject of inquiry and 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 not you know and and, and kind of avoid some of the direct inquiries that are part of the UFLPA. Is that is that fair to say, or am I am I not? I guess correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, it's fair to say that, yeah. Okay. But of course, like uh, if a company is terminated because of uh, Xinjiang issue, uh, it's still like a violate AFSL. Right, and you'll probably have a con- contractual lawsuit even if a company is terminated for a Xinjiang issue. Mm, yeah, it depending on the contract, there is a risk. Okay, Richard. Yeah, Tim, on- yeah, Tim, Tim. This is largely a packaging issue. Um, the what we hear from from companies is we don't we want to ask the questions without without explicitly mentioning Xinjiang or the UFLPA. So how do we get there? And um, and so in the when the company goes out to the suppliers and asks those inquiries, um, it's being done. You know the the approach that Kate mentioned is certainly one where it's packaged as a broader ESG issue. There are other cases where simply you can ask the question of where did you get this material without necessarily saying confirm that you didn't get it from Xinjiang, um, and so and so that has that has yielded some success certainly, uh, but at the same time there's it's still one of the tricky the trickier issues around this law the fact that um, we don't get the visibility and we're not getting the uh, the responses that we wish we did in in conducting this type of diligence in part um, as a result of of this law that prohibits those types of, of questions. Got it. So, oh, go ahead, Virginia. Um, just wanted to weigh back in um, after hearing Kate's thoughts too. Um, one thing I would say is that, you know, from the U.S. perspective, this approach that we're talking about now probably is not exactly how CBP or DHS would have envisioned it happening and would like it to play out. You know, they would like the code of conduct to say no XUAR content is permitted. Um, and so this is very much like companies are to Kate's, to Kate's point, they're reaching this sort of middle ground and they're trying to make sure that they adequately scope even how they're conducting the diligence in the first place um, so that they're not being overly aggressive and minimizing risks under Chinese law, but still accounting for their high risk products under U.S. law. Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a common dilemma in the sanctions context. It has been going on for a while, and I think it it it, it sometimes helps at least me to think about it from the perspective if if some other country had a law that told the U.S. what what products from a particular state could happen. The U.S. you could see that the U.S. would immediately pass a law just like the Chinese government did that said, "Hey, we don't agree with that." Right? I mean, if if basically you know some country overseas said no products coming from Texas because we're gonna assume that basically everybody t- in Texas is doing terrible things to people like flying them to other states against their will and and so we're going to start not accepting products from Texas um, you know I, I think the response from the US would be very similar to the one in China but I, I think C- CBP and DHS may not like that but the reality is when you start to enforce your laws in an extraterritorial way you create these sorts of issues we've seen it in Europe We've seen it in, in actually Canada. We've seen it in China. We've seen it in Russia with respect to the Russia sanctions. And some of these laws have more success than others. But you have to find out a way. I mean, companies that we represent have to navigate those issues because you can't just say, well, we're going to go into a, another country and, and enforce U.S. law in the way that the U.S. enforcers want to do it because the U.S. is not in charge of those countries. Um, so why don't we move on to, you all mentioned some industries that had been targeted. I am assuming that most of the, the cases that you're working on are in in those targeted industries, or if have they have have the compliance issues spilled over to other industries as well. And I'll start with I'll start with Richard on this one, and then we'll we'll move to to Kate in Virginia. Um, sure. So this law and related laws have um, have really uh, changed the scope of our practice. Uh, so it's 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 uh, become one of the central issues of our customs and business and human rights practices, um, and. We t- we tend to view our work in in kind of two buckets. One is all the work that we're doing I- I- responding to I- enforcement actions, 
So, and for those enforcement actions, you're right. Most of our clients, most of the companies that are affected are in the apparel and the solar space. And those two um, industries certainly have, there's many kind of lessons learned that are going to be transferable to and all of the other industries that come right behind it. And then the other piece of it is broader and it's helping companies um, implement everything that the U.S. government now requires and increasingly the world requires relating to due diligence around issues like forced labor. So many companies, especially the multinationals, are, if they're not there already, moving toward um, enhancing their programs to include the same type of diligence um, processes that uh, you know, risk-based diligence processes that companies that have been under scrutiny under the UFLPA or other anti-forced labor laws are are doing. So I think that's kind of high level what um, what summarizes kind of the state of affairs right now. And and if I'm a com- if I'm a company outside those industries, I'm still going to want to because of the, the emerging trend. I'm still going to want to. In- Include this sort of issue in my compliance program. Yeah, th- and to give you to give you an example, um, there is there are new requirements. You, you may have heard of CTPAT, which is a voluntary uh, program between the uh, between importers between the trade importers exporters and um, and U.S. Customs. And basically, you you exchange certain uh, you take on certain compliance hurdles, compliance requirements in exchange for some benefits that the that customs offers you to basically facilitate trade there are many companies that are part of this program and unrelated to whether you have any concerns around china and xinjiang you under under this program effective next year all companies have to have um, what customs calls a social compliance program which essentially has all of the elements of that we're talking about to address these these issues around forced labor. So, um, you know, as the world moves towards mandatory due diligence requirements around suppliers, and as this becomes a central issue for brands, yes, um, it not only it's not only in the uh, UFLPA context, but in, but in other contexts, kind of this is the new this is a new um, a new way of doing business in a way, certainly one that multinationals are taking very seriously. Yeah, and that's actually a great segue into my next question. So, Kate, uh, you know, as the as as these sorts of supply chain due diligence issues evolve, do you think it'll get easier to do this sort of due diligence in China going forward? Because we're at a relatively new stage with this law in the states, and these sort of due diligence questions are relatively new. What do you think the prospects are for for making this easier as time goes by? Um. Uh, uh, I agree that um, uh, as uh, time goes by, uh, more and more companies are uh, would be uh, more acceptable uh, to this and understand uh, why this is uh, needed. Uh, and uh, at the same time, I think uh, like uh, importers, multinational companies are getting to know what's the best way to approach it uh, and what's acceptable uh, under the Chinese culture to ask what kind of questions. So I think things will get smoother. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, I think it's uh, um, important uh, to keep in mind the data compliance part, uh, which is another thing that the company needs to comply with uh, in China. Uh, and uh, as um, uh, Virginia mentioned, there are automatic ways to collect the information and there are certain platforms doing the diligence, etc. And it's important to keep in mind there are various, actually very complex system in China about what kind of data can be transferred across border. And there are a vast amount of data uh, that uh, may be collected uh, during this process. And there are uh, data security law, uh, there are PIPL, personal information protection law, separate security law, and there are many implementation rules, and there can be industry-specific laws. I don't think we have time to go into all the details, but it's uh, important to keep in mind. No, that's well, fascinating because it yeah. sounds extremely complica- complicated <laughs> to collect this information. I mean, you've got the issues that we talked about where there is this kind of pushback uh, because the, it does – the U.S. law uh, – by its nature, tries to uh, to to address issues within the, within China, 
but but also i mean even if you can overcome that you've got all sorts of other issues that arise with the collection of data in a foreign country where you know as as the us does and as many countries do china protects the the personal data of its of its citizens and of its residents and so it sounds like that's another hurdle that you have to overcome when you collect this data Exactly, and the one thing I want to strike is in China, data compliance not only cover personal information, but also other data. For example, important data,、oh, uh, and、uh, we may collect important data during the process as well. What about interviews? Does that also do, do Chinese laws affect the the way that if a U.S. company were going to try and come in and conduct interviews with Chinese employees, does China on these due diligence issues, would Chinese law affect those sorts of interviews as well? Uh, if it's a company doing interviews of employees, uh, it's uh, not prohibited. Uh, but I would recommend to be very、um, cautious uh, and sensitive about the questions you ask,、uh, whether it's、uh, internal or external to other suppliers. And normally, would I, would would if I were if I were working with you, say on a on a matter like this, normally I would guess that you would be the one that would be conducting the interviews. That it would make a lot more sense to have. Local Chinese counsel conducting any interviews, even of company employees, than than having U.S. counsel come in and and do those same interviews. Yeah, we can help with that, and the、uh, uh, the companies can do some interviews themselves as well.、Uh, no matter what ways、uh, collected,、uh, I think it's important to keep in mind how to collect it,、uh, because we have seen a real risk in this area is a media crisis, PR crisis. There have been、uh, cases out there,、um, which、uh, I think people can find online, where、uh, companies has been、um, uh, there are different ways that it can become a media crisis. But once the public notice that、uh, a company store used、uh, stopped using Xinjiang product, or、uh, store stopped carrying Xinjiang product, it can become a public、uh, crisis. And there are companies that are boycotted、uh, by the public,、uh, and also consumers report、uh, to the Chinese local government about product liability issue, food safety、uh, issue, etc. And then it trigger a chain of、uh, enforcement, collateral government enforcement. Tim, Tim, let me let me add to that.、Uh, one thing that we haven't. Discussed is is that kind of at at the center of this law from the U.S. perspective, is the need for the importer to prove a negative. Well, that and that's what I wanted to go there next because what we've been talking is about is basically how a company would try and avoid the enforcement mechanism. But I think where I wanted to go next is kind of tell us a little more about the enforcement mechanism because it's basically an you know the, if, if there's this import. Mechanism. The normal rule, as I understand it, in imports is that you know you don't have to prove a negative. Basically, there's a if they they see a problem with the import, and by they it's DHS and CBP see a problem with the import, they can they can stop it, they can detain it. But under the new law, it, it, there's if the, if there's any if it comes from Xinjiang, there's a presumption that there's a problem, and it, the company has to prove that there's not. Is that right? Well, it starts it starts a little bit. Uh, earlier than that, I think,、um, which is the detention. It, fr- first of all, the enforcement agency is customs. So at this point, DHS is kind of at the policy level, but but the enforcers、uh, in this case are the customs officials. So、uh, it starts with customs、um, having detaining merchandise, targeting and detaining merchandise based on a reasonable but not conclusive. That's the standard.、Um, Suspicion of forced labor. They will target a shipment and detain that shipment at the port. At that point, they will issue a notice of detention that will mention that will say we're detaining this pursuant to the UFLPA, but they won't tell you why. Right, so that's kind of like one of the first hurdles. It's like, well, we we understand that you're detaining it under the UFLPA, but. Then every then then the, the burden shifts to to you the importer, and and it, and it's up to you to determine and to to demonstrate that、um, these goods should be released, and you have to kind of divine what what the customs concerns are around this, knowing only that they have UFLPA related concerns.、Um, so at that point, it, you you rec- importer receives a notice of of 
uh, detention and you're off to the races, you have 30 days to demonstrate that to make one of one or two uh, follow one of two paths under path one, which is the the most commonly used path. In fact, I think the only path that has been used to date. Um, you say CBP, you got it wrong. Uh, you have concerns about our merchandise in Xinjiang or an, or UFLPA entity list party. In fact, we have none of that in our merchandise, and we're going to demonstrate it to you. Under path two, the importer says you're right. We did. There is a connection to UFL to a UFLPA entity list party or Xinjiang, but there no forced labor was used, and we can demonstrate it to you. That second path is uh, that's when the rebuttable presumption um, kicks in, and that second path is so hard to overcome that I don't think it's worth talking about it in this podcast. I think we should talk about the first, the the first and more realistic um, avenue, which is path one. Uh, we kind of internally refer to it as path one, which is CBP, you got it wrong. And we're going to show you through due diligence reports and uh, traceability documentation that none of the components come from Xinjiang. Now, think about it that you, you have to you have to do this within a 30 day period unless you get an extension. And that that's probably hurdle number two. You don't know what you're fighting necessarily. And you have 30 days to provide information that by the way you're not you're not keeping regularly because you your your product may have five or six seven um you know tiers of suppliers and while while it may be reasonable for the company to have good visibility on the first or second tier right the direct supplier and the one behind it when we're talking about eight layers back that's another story and that's the type of information you have to uh, you have to provide within that 30 day framework so Virginia, so that's the framework. What are we seeing on the ground? We've had, you know, I guess six months to a, a closer to a year of the UFLPA. What are we seeing in terms of releases? What are we seeing in terms of detentions? Uh, how is enforcement going? So you asked the question earlier about um, different industries and if we're just seeing certain industries like cotton and solar really focus on this or if it's kind of trickling on expanding to other new industries. Um, I would say, you know, we've only seen enforcement so far in those high priority sectors, which we're already experiencing enforcement under the withhold release order framework, which was in place before the UFLPA came into effect. So for the companies that are experiencing enforcement right now, most of them are pretty well versed in the process of interacting with CBP in order to release goods that have been detained on suspicions of forced labor. So they've already got at least some level of sophistication with respect to supply chain mapping, with respect to their traceability documentation. So this is why um, you're this is why you're doing the due diligence, right? So that when this happens, exactly. you can okay. Sorry to exactly. cut you off. So, but, all I would know that that's a great point because what I would say is that if the, if CBP had begun enforcing this in new sectors on day one in June, those new sectors would have had no chance of being able to respond to CBP. We're seeing very sophisticated players who have very good traceability systems in place, um, strong supply chain mapping, still struggle in meeting CBP's expectations. So they experienced enforcement under the WROs. They figured out how to deal with that. And then as CBP started enforcing the UFLPA, they have a higher standard. And now these companies are, are waiting and, and seeing if they have enough information to, see, to give CBP to satisfy them. And CBP is asking several follow-up questions. They're requesting additional documentation after packages are first submitted. And as we all know, based on CBP's statements at the end of September, no shipments have been released yet. So um, I think that that's pretty telling, but we think that CBP is probably aligning internally. They're, they're dealing with a huge learning curve and a lot of additional resources to handle these hundreds of shipments that have been detained. Um, in other sectors, there there's now this kind of like, uh, I wouldn't say like rumors or whisperings, but expected or anticipated enforcement in potential new high priority sectors. And those companies in those sectors are aware of the incredible burden it is to respond to a CBP detention or just to satisfy their downstream customers if they're not direct importers, because those direct importers might have questions for them to prepare for potential enforcement. So those companies are, are kind of doing a, a mock 
um, enforcement or just coming up with a compliance program that really is focused on traceability and supply chain visibility in the event that their goods are detained or their customers' goods are detained. So let's let's hear about the whispers. So what 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 are we hearing in terms of new in terms of new sectors? Everybody has. I I think that you know Richard and I know so many consultants in this space. I'd be really curious to hear if Kate has any um, has anything she's heard too. But I would say that the auto industry. There was a report that was published last spring, and I should mention Richard also discussed NGO reports. Um, we know that CBP has informed their targeting, which is how they select which shipments to detain and which companies to focus on. They inform that targeting based on public and private reports of alleged forced labor in supply chains or exposure to Xinjiang in supply chains. So NGO reports are very relevant because that often precipitates CBP enforcement in a particular sector. So we have seen several media reports and NGO reports discussing the auto industry and EV batteries. Um, we've also heard, and, and I am not one who's kind of been hearing this one a lot, but it seems like many consultants are focused on pharma uh, or on medical tech. And um, Richard probably can think of a couple others that, that I haven't mentioned here. Oh, Let's and then go. a PVC is another one. Sorry. A PVC. And, and um, so PVC, it sounds like um, EV batteries and uh, the auto sector is what you're hearing. Kate and Richard, um, any whispers about I- industries that may face enforcement risks coming soon to a, a, a port near you? Virginia and I work so closely on this that I don't have anything that Virginia doesn't have here. So you're not you're not keeping perfect. any secrets. It, it, I'm not I'm not keeping any secrets. No. How about you, Kate? Any new industries that you're hearing about that might be targeted? I think they covered it very well already. <laughs> okay, good. And from from your end, Kate, when an enforcement ha- action happens in the U.S., do you work with U.S. companies to try and? Um, get the shipment out? Is that part of your your mandate? Or are you mostly working on due diligence issues? We would work with uh, uh, U.S. firms uh, to help with that. Okay. And as I understand it, there's, there's is, and I could have my numbers wrong, but there's 1,400 or so um, detentions at this point and, and no releases. Is that right? I have to check the numbers. I thought it was... 800 and pulling up pulling up a presentation right now i thought that we were up to about half a billion dollars in 800 detentions that that could but be that right i'm sure you know, i'm so. sure your numbers are better than yeah, mine that's that's that's, that's, that's right, right but but the uh yeah. um the, the notion of no detentions of no releases i think is a little bit deceiving. Well, that was my question. That, my question right. was going to be like, what does that mean? Does that mean that it's, you know, 0 and 1400 or 0 and 800? Or is it the, you just haven't heard back yet? Exactly. It's that. It's that. It's that. Well, as, as far as we know, I mean, we have many uh, cases before um, before customs right now. And that is certainly that that is certainly true that this is a process that as much as people would prefer to, for it to be kind of uh, faster and maybe have a 30 day turnaround or a two week turnaround. Um, the reality is that it, it has involved, it involves a lot of back and forth between the companies and, uh, and CBP. Uh, there sometimes several office CBP offices involved in the review. So sometimes you have, uh, auditors at customs, you have the legal looking at, at the submission. Um, you have the, the, uh, commodity specific hub that, um, has oversight over the the products that that you know your company imports, um, and all of those have some type of input into the process. And so, what we have experienced is a lot of back and forth. So, an initial submission isn't um, the end all. It's it you t- tend to have a couple of follow up questions and potentially additional submissions. So, um, it's just too early in the game to know whether. Um, uh, you know whether whether the fact that there hasn't been any any releases under the UFLPA means that that none will be released. Um, and one thing we will note is that under under the prior um, you know enforcement regime under the withhold release orders or WROs, um, what we experienced were significant delays in processing the cases, but eventual pretty good success, especially in the solar industry around releases. 
um, less so in the apparel industry, but certainly uh, around in, in the solar industry, when when, an, when a company was able to produce all of the, everything that was required after several months of collecting the information, it resulted in a release. So not ideal from the company's perspective, but certainly uh, a reason for optimism in in the process overall. And in in these analogous cases, how long are we talking about in terms of the process? It sounds like it takes several months to to you, so you have the the detention, you have several months of collecting information. It sounds like an iterative process where you know CBP says you, you send the information, they ask further questions. Couple three months there. How long from the time that you're done with the questions to to when you get a decision from CBP? And just ballpark. We're we're waiting to figure that out right now. I think that that's one of the you know the primary questions that companies that are experiencing enforcement have is how quickly can CBP get these answers? And right now, just because it's that first push for enforcement and CBP is really schooling up on how they're going to do this, I don't think we have um, any expectation. I'd be surprised if it goes longer than six months, but Richard, please weigh in. Yeah, it's cer- it's certainly not 30, 30 days, days, which was which was what the, I know what the industry would, some in the industry would want to see, kind of a set process of, you know, within 30 days, you're going to have a response, uh, you know, up or down. It's certainly not that. Instead, Customs has just taken its time. And I think we're looking at a multi-month, you know, set three month at a minimum um, process. And, and in this first iteration, it has taken longer. So where do we go from here? So, so we've talked a lot about the UFLPA, and um, we've talked a lot about the model that it use that it's used. And you're, it, we're just in kind of it sounds like the 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 infancy of the UFLPA. But but at least in the sanctions context, in the export controls context, once uh, Congress and or the executive branch come up with a model and target one country or one industry or one one issue, that model generally expands. Do we have any indication that this model is going to be used on other issues? The kind of the import, um, the, the the import model and the rebuttable presumption model and, and these sorts of things. And and I guess two two questions on that. One. Let's start with the forced labor context, but then I think after that, let's talk about whether or not it, it, that that model could be used for other issues. I think that you, you, we discussed a little bit earlier how this will end up trending and, and whether there's other circumstances that are kind of urging companies to conduct this due diligence, even if they're not under the microscope for potential enforcement. Um, and I think personally that the future is probably going to be more companies pushing for supply chain visibility and for some level of a traceability system to be able to evidence where their goods are coming from. You know, we see with the Inflation Reduction Act, there are certain requirements for the content of batteries that can come from certain jurisdictions that require some supply chain tracing. We're seeing more and more of a push towards ESG, both in China and in Europe. Um, And there's OECD principles, which also require some sort of supply chain management. So that's not just a U.S. issue. And then finally, just general supply chain issues and business continuity. There's been, you know, rolling shortages of labor and inability for factories to be online 100% of the time, too. And I think that all of these factors together are really making companies realize I need to have a good handle on my supply chain. Um, And coincidentally, they should use those efforts to also inform their anti-forced labor compliance program, because otherwise that's just leaving their time and resources on the table. I'll add to that to that confluence of events, um, a, a lot of brand awareness, uh, especially in the apparel sector where we where we spend a lot of time. Uh, for a lot of uh, the brands that are involved in this, um, it, you have it, it is a set, it, sustainability and traceability is a certain is a is part of their DNA, so they need to get it right. And um, there are a number of new tools uh, that are emerging as a result of kind of increased legal interest around this that are helping companies kind of get to the next level. So we've had the privilege of working with some of the best companies with the best sustainability programs. And even then, there's, there's significant room to grow to adapt to this new reality of, for example, collecting information that has never been collected before. But that, and that it's going to take a while to be able to do so effectively, 
but it but it but it's going to change it's going to be a game changer um in the way that um it, you know in a, in in a short amount of time we think the companies are just going to have way more visibility and are going to be able to um kind of further double down on these sustainability claims and and especially at a time when there's so much pressure around kind of the overall ESG narrative interesting and kate i'm going to turn to you for for I, what i think is probably going to be the final question so you talked about the anti foreign sanctions law in china and we've most we've talked about it today exclusively with respect to the uflpa are there other sanctions laws that are targeting china for from other jurisdictions that that law would apply to so for example like the are you seeing these sorts of laws um coming from the EU or the UK or other countries that are that are coming after China or is it just a US issue are we the only ones that are trying to exert extraterritorial jurisdiction over ta- China yeah so uh, the per- uh, this law was passed uh, not for um, the uh, uh, UFPL uh, and um, uh, it's a uh, not for a particular country uh, it's really uh, a protection um, a tool uh, that can be used for any uh, such kind of uh, 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 measures. Uh, so, um, uh, but like for this anti-sanction list we have seen so far uh, is um, uh, the list I uh, mentioned it at the beginning uh, is not for this forced labor act, uh, but other actions uh, which affect uh, like Xinjiang, Taiwan, or Hong Kong. Uh, so um, it could be uh, broad, much broader than this. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll give the final word to you all if you want to say anything else about the UFLPA or about trade issues generally, because I, I think we're we're wrapping up our, our all issues international trade episode of Embargo. All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming on the podcast, and it was very good to have you, Tim. Let me let me uh, end with with just a final note here, and which is important on the UFLPA, and it's that it's not even though the intent of the law is to protect Uyghurs in the Xinjiang region. In practice, this is something that affects trade with China as a whole, and so sometimes we hear kind of comments of like, "Well, yeah, we don't have any facilities in Xinjiang, or we don't know any any you know we really don't have any concerns in that region." In reality, what the law requires, as a practical matter, is if you if you have suppliers in China, direct or indirect, um, there's a need to conduct due diligence because if you can't come up with a paperwork to dem and and the and the results of diligence to demonstrate that. Um, there, there's no connection to the region or to the uh, uh, entity list parties. Then you can you can be in a position where your goods are not going to be in, uh, admissible and imported into the United States. So I, I always like to kind of remind people that this is about more than this just region. This is kind of like a broader China wide concern uh, because the name I think sometimes, to be frank, kind of turns people. Um, Turns people off when they when when they they come to the conclusion that they have no particular interest there. Yeah, I want to echo uh, with the Richard comment. So the supply chain uh, now with the globalization is so intertwined. Uh, the uh, while some of the factories uh, may have moved out of China, uh, but the, the uh, raw material uh, may be coming from China. And for some um, uh, components, uh, there are certain Chinese companies are doing so well. Uh, they are really accounting for a majority of the global market share. Uh, so when we look at this, uh, it's not just uh, a, uh, like China supply chain uh, because of the traceability. It can be globally like anywhere. Uh, it may be traced back. So it really have a very profound impact on the global supply chain. Well, thank you, Kate. And I, I, I'm going to give you the last word, Virginia, on this. Oh my last word, man. Um, I, I don't really have anything to add to, to what Kate just said, I and Richard as well. Um, I find the conversations with Kate from the Chinese perspective just absolutely fascinating. So I'm really grateful for the chance to, to meet with both of you and with Richard. Um, I'm looking forward to working more on this. Great. Well, thanks to all of our guests today. Thanks especially to Kate um, for coming from China and then also Richard and Virginia um, coming here from Washington, D.C. Uh, 
that ends this week's episode of Embargoed. So um, stay sanctions free and uh, stay detention free as well, everyone. Produced by HeartCast Media.